Okay. Hi, um, I'm Mark Brooker. I'm a senior principal engineer here at AWS. Um, and I, uh, I've worked on a whole lot of things in the 13 years I've been at AWS. Uh, but uh, most recently, my focus has been on serverless uh, and, uh, and even more recently on our database products, where we're doing some really exciting serverless-related work. But this talk is about Lambda uh, and about adding container support to AWS Lambda and some of the challenges and opportunities we, uh, we faced while we were trying to do that uh, and what we learned along the way. So let's start with the evolution of Lambda and a little bit of, uh, of background for, for this problem. Uh, so first, you know, what is Lambda, if you aren't familiar with it? Um, so this is a service that we run at AWS. You provide code or a, an image, a container image, and we run it when things happen. And those things can be API calls, they can be database queries, they can be gets to S3, streams, messages, and so on. Uh, there are you know, many service integrations, um, and, uh, and you can build your own. Um, it's serverless, which means there's no provisioning or managing servers. Uh, you can bring your own uh, container, your own language uh, with a whole Linux user land if you want, arbitrary x86 binaries, or you can use one of the built-in languages, which is particularly cool uh, because the minimal function is uh, two to three lines of Python. So getting started is just super easy. And then we support two ways of kind of bringing your code into Lambda. Uh, one of them is a zip file up to 250 megabytes. And then the one we added late last year was container images uh, with a maximum of 10 gigabytes. And the other property of Lambda that makes this specifically interesting is that Lambda scales up in, in milliseconds in response to traffic. So if the number of things increases, you get more API calls, your streams get busier, you get more messages, uh, Lambda will increase the number of your functions um, that it's running, run them on more machines, um, and do that very quickly. And it turns out that these two requirements, supporting big container images up to 10 gigabytes and scaling up in, in milliseconds, are really hard to do together. Um, and for the obvious physical reasons of you just have to move a lot of data around to have the right function in the right place before you can start accepting traffic. Um, and when we, you know, as, as the Lambda team set out to solve this problem, we didn't want to compromise. We didn't want to say, okay, um, you know, container scale up would take a lot longer. Um, so let me put this in context of the, the Lambda architecture a little bit. Um, so here's a very high level overview of the Lambda architecture. Uh, there's a front end API, which gets those events in uh, through an API we call invoke. Then it goes to a stateful load balancer layer, which, uh, which takes an event, matches it to the right place for it to execute uh, and makes sure that, um, you know, events are well concentrated uh, to, to take advantage of locality. They're well spread out to get great availability and so on. Uh, and then the, the, the sort of meat of the whole thing is, is this worker fleet, right? Like many, many, many thousands of workers. Uh, and each of those workers supports hundreds to thousands of micro VMs, real virtual machines uh, that are running your function, are running your code. And so when we say scale up, we mean creating a brand new micro VM on one of these workers with your code provisioned in it, ready to start executing. And this brings us with it brings some you know some challenges, as I said, just moving the data around. Um, and so challenge number one is just that, right? Containers are big, um, but the opportunity is that they're also quite sparse. And so we can look at these results from, uh, from a paper from Harter, um, their Slacker paper um, in, in 2016, which shows uh, for a large number of container workloads, um, the number of reads uh, that are actually needed to start up whatever is inside that container uh, compared to the size of the container compressed and uncompressed. And what you can see here is that even taking compression into account, um, the number of reads required to start a workload in a container is much, much smaller um, than the amount of IO required to move the whole container around. And so this is an opportunity, right? Like this is opportunity number one, is that we don't actually need to move the whole container around. We just need to move around the bits of data that the actual function needs. Um, and so our approach is very different from the approach that Slacker takes, uh, but the opportunity 
opportunity is the same, right? To, uh, to close this gap or to move around only the data that needs to be moved around to get it into, into the right place at the right time. So how do we do this? Well, you might be aware that a container is uh, some metadata around a set of uh, tar files, essentially. Uh, so we take the stack of tar files, uh, the container ecosystem calls these layers, uh, and deterministically flatten them into a file system. Deterministic is important there. And what we mean there is that we, if you take the same layers um, or the same image and flatten it into a file system, you get exactly the same bytes on disk every time. Uh, and it turns out that most file systems don't behave this way. Um, and so we had to do some work to do that. And then we take this file system and we chunk it up. We take it at the kind of uh, bits and bytes level and we break it up into chunks of data. And so what this lets us do is load only the chunks of data that are needed to serve reads uh, that the micro VM makes. But we want to hide this entirely from the user's code, right? We don't want to, you to change your code to take advantage of this. And so we built in at the, uh, at the VMM layer, at this layer we call Firecracker. Um, and Firecracker is the VMM that we built that is specialized for serverless and, and container applications. And at this layer, we built in this kind of sparse IO layer um, that takes a vertio read uh, that comes in, in from the micro VM figures out which of chunk is needed to, uh, to serve that read uh, and serves it up. Um, and to the system running inside the micro VM, it's none the wiser and that just looks like a normal IO. So going into a little bit more detail here, we have the firecracker process. And so that's, that's getting the kind of vertio stuff uh, from, um, from the, the guest. Um, the firecracker process then talks to the sparse file system agent, uh, sending it reads and writes. Um, the sparse file system agent contains a write overlay and a dedicated local cache of recently accessed data. Then it reads that it doesn't have in its local cache, it forwards onto a shared, uh, at the sort of machine level, uh, shared local cache. Um, and uh, and things that aren't there, uh, it forwards on to a shared AZ local cache. So why is all this caching interesting? Well, all this caching interesting is that containers have a lot of common data. Uh, and this is for the simple reason that when people build stuff on containers, they build them on common base layers like uh, Alpine and Debian and uh, you know, Amazon Linux. Uh, and so lots and lots of different containers will have a lot of data in common. And so we want to deduplicate. But it turns out that deduplication is really difficult in the presence of encryption. And we need to be able to encrypt data. And deduplication is difficult in the presence of encryption uh, for the simple reason that if you, you know, if you use lots and lots of keys, which you should, you don't want to have this one master key, um, every different key you use to encrypt the same plain text will create a different ciphertext. And so deduplication is something you need to do at the kind of plain text level, but you also want to encrypt. And so to solve this problem, uh, we turn to a technique called convergent encryption. And at a high level, what we do there is that we take the plain text of a chunk, and so this is one of those chunks of the file system um, that we created after flattening. We hash that, mixing in some herbs and spices for, for extra flavor. Uh, and then we end up with a unique per chunk key. And then we use that key to encrypt the chunk uh, using an authenticated encryption scheme, creating an enveloped chunk um, that not only contains the encrypted data, but contains some extra payload that allows us to verify that the encrypted data has been unmodified. We take those same keys and we write them down in a manifest for the image that we're currently building. Then the system takes that envelope chunk and it offers it up to a, the, the content addressable storage system and says, you know, I have a chunk with this hash. Um, and the content addressable storage system will very often say, uh, yeah, I've already got that. And what's magical about this scheme is that the same plain text turns into the same cipher text every time without the requirement for a master key. Um, and then we write these things down in the image manifest. We package that manifest up, encrypt it with the user's KMS key, and that goes together with their Lambda function. Um, 
providing this nice kind of minimum privilege uh, scheme um, for, for flattening images. Then we have challenge number three. Systems need to be deployed, systems need to be scaled, uh, and systems occasionally suffer failures, right? Like hosts fail, networks fail, uh, power fails, and so on. And so we need to build systems that are resilient to that. And the specific system I'm most interested in in this bit of the talk is this shared AZ local cache, the kind of left box here. Um, and I'm most interested in that because that is the piece that has the blast radius, right? When I say AZ, I mean, sorry, AWS availability zone, so a kind of data center scale. Um, and this is a shared component at the data center scale, and so it needs to be very high availability. And because I want to make sure that the hit rate on that cache is super, super high, um, it also needs to have, uh, you know, not lose data very often. So why does that happen? Well, let's think about a common kind of uh, cache architecture. So the typical cache architecture is you take these chunks of data, whatever you're going to hash, uh, whatever you're going to cache, um, you generally hash their names, uh, and then you use some function of that hash to figure out which, which, which cache they go on. Um, and this can be consistent hashing, it can be one of the many variant schemes of consistent hashing, um, but the bottom line is that keys are spread um, across a distributed cache fleet uh, in a way that you can grow and shrink the fleet without you know, mixing everything up, but it still has some impact. So let's consider the simple case of a host failure. Um, and so if I get a host failure of the cache host that chunk A was on, in the kind of naive version of that scheme, um, that one failure means that chunk A is not available. And in fact, one over N of our chunks is not available. And so if our cache is on 10 hosts, our hit rate drops to at best 90%. If it's on 100 hosts, 99% or so on. But I want to keep it super high. And so this isn't really an acceptable trade-off. There are many, many ways to solve this kind of problem. Uh, you know, you can, you can replicate data. You can put chunks in multiple places. Uh, you can make those cache nodes super highly available. Uh, you can add another layer. Um, but the one that we chose was based on erasure coding. And so we take a chunk and we put it through this mathematical function called an erasure code. And what this function does is take a chunk of data and break it up into multiple pieces. And of those pieces, you only need some of them to put the original chunk back together. So for example, it can break it up into three pieces, which you can put it back together out of any two, like one and three, one and two, three and one, etc. cetera, uh, two and three. Um, and so this is a well-understood piece of, of mathematics. Erasure coding is, a, uh, um, is a, a very powerful technique that's been around for a long period of time, but it has some magical properties uh, that we really love in this uh, particular context. Um, first, there's no hit rate drop from one failure. So if we, hit, if we lose one of those cache nodes, because we've spread the erasure coding stripes for each chunk over multiple machines, um, losing a cache node means that we can't get that piece of the data, but we can still put that chunk to back together from the other pieces that are available. And so if I do two of three and I lose one, I still have two, uh, and I can still put the chunk back together. And when that node is back to being available or we've scaled up or whatever, uh, we can do a kind of read repair where we, uh, we put that third uh, you know, stripe back in its place. Uh, and this is great because it means that there's no hit rate drop from a, a single host failure, but it has some other nice properties. One of those nice properties is that erasure codes are kind of infinitely adjustable. Uh, we can trade off um, the number of IOs throwing through the system, uh, the number of failures we can tolerate, um, you know, the amount of uh, throughput that we're willing to spend uh, on pretty much any set of, of physically possible combinations. Um, and so that's very powerful because it gives us a whole design space to explore, to optimize for cost, to optimize for latency, optimize for availability, optimize for hit rate, and so on. The other cool thing about erasure coding is it really helps our tail latency story. Um, and so why that is uh, is, is not in, potentially not entirely obvious. Um, but if we go to three nodes and one of them is slow, uh, I don't have to wait for that one because I can put my thing together out of the two that I get first. 
Or if I'm using a, a different erasure code, maybe I go to five nodes and I can put it together out of the first three or 10 nodes and put it together out of the first eight or whatever, you know, whatever kind of configuration I like. And by being able to just ignore those slow nodes, I can build a system that has really great tail latency behavior and is very resilient uh, against gray failures. And gray failures are some of the hardest failures to deal with in the cloud. This isn't a unique property of erasure coding. It's a property of quorum systems in general, uh, but it's a really nice one for caches, especially caches where, like here, we're very sensitive to latency uh, and we're very sensitive especially to tail latency. And this is what makes me excited as an engineer and as somebody who's building things uh, at AWS, is we get to take these customer problems, like adding container support to Lambda. We get to develop our new techniques for tackling them. And then we get to take existing techniques from the body of systems knowledge and combine those ideas to solve these real at scale problems for our customers. I find that very exciting. I can learn you know, the, the state of the art of, of, the, um, of the field and apply that to my customers' problems while inventing solutions of our own. Um, and what's fun about this is we get to build these things, we get to solve problems with this toolkit, uh, and then have them running across hundreds of thousands of customers, uh, many millions of influx per second, um, you know, from, from day one, uh, which is really just exciting scale. 